Of those 170 kinds of mites that live on bees, there's only three of them really causing problems. Um, the rest of them probably are benign. They probably aren't doing anything one way or the other. They probably aren't helping and they probably aren't hurting, but um, several of them live on the bees and a lot of them live in the colony somewhere. Um, I probably shouldn't scare you by telling you how many different kinds of mites live on humans, but <laughs> cause, cause there's lots of them that live on you too. Um, there's, there's at least 30 kinds of insects that I can think of that I find in the debris in the, in the bottom of the colony and or living on the bees. There's only a few that live on the bees. Bruella would be one of those. It's a, they, they call it a bee lab, so it's not really a louse. It's actually an insect that lives on a, on a bee, and it doesn't really do any good or any harm that we know of. But there's other kinds of things like pseudoscorpions that eat mites. Um, there, there are other mites that eat mites too, that back in those 170 kinds of mites we talked about. But um, the reference is there just in case you question where I got my numbers, you can go look them up. Um, there are over 8,000 kinds of microorganisms that have actually been identified that are living in a bee colony. Um, these are mostly identified by a lady named Martha Gillum, and these are just the ones she can culture. The fact is there's probably three or four times that many because a lot, a lot of the ecology of microorganisms is that this microorganism may actually live on the byproducts of that microorganism. So this bacteria might actually just live on the waste products of that bacteria. And trying to culture this bacteria that lives on the waste product of another bacteria is a very difficult thing unless you know exactly what that other bacteria is ahead of time so that you can culture it, so that you can get its waste products, so that you can culture the one you're trying to figure out here. So there's probably three times that, but that's just the ones that Martha Gillum um, identified when she, when she was doing this back in the 80s. I think it's probably gonna, this number is probably going to jump tremendously because of CCD and because of the newer technology, they can do a lot of DNA testing and they can find DNA for microorganisms that they can't even culture. Um, but there's at least 8,000 that we know of. And this is a reference actually to an article by the USDA where they make that exact claim that there's 8,000 and they quote Martha Gillum. Um, if you'd like to read Martha Gillum's research, um, that's a link to a place where a lot of it has been put. She probably did more research on the microorganisms that live in the bee than anybody else. Um, and, and the ones that live in the bee colony that are directly involved with the bees. So, what happens if you treat to all that ecology we just talked about? Um, well, humidil will kill a, a certain swath of those. It'll kill most of the fungus and most of the yeasts. It'll also disrupt and kill some of the, some of the bacteria. Um, Teramycin kills mostly bacteria, but um, it's pretty broad spectrum. Kind of short lived. Luckily, it doesn't stay in the colony very long, which is why the USDA and the FDA originally said you could put it in a bee colony, is because it's short lived enough that they think it won't show up in the food supply. Um, assuming you use it at the time of year that it's, it's recommended, the theory is that it will have broken down by the time the honey gets to the shelf. Um, and that's prob probably true. Tylosin, however, is the new thing that a lot of the beekeepers are using, and it's not short lived, it's very long lived. And it's uh, probably even more broad spectrum. Certainly, tylosin, none of the bacteria that live in the colony have had decades to build up resistance to it. The teramycin, people have been using it for 50 years, and so there's the bacteria build up a resistance that and, and probably a new balance has been found in the colonies where they're being where it's being used all the time. The, 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 the bacteria they have to have to survive has managed to to survive the, the, the uh, teramycin and build up a resistance, but now we start using tylosin to kill all those off. So um, I, I, think we're, I think in the end we're gonna find colony collapse disorders probably because we've disrupted the microbes in the colony so much, especially with the tylosin and, uh, and the new organic acids that are being used. Um, essential oils are a very broad spectrum antimicrobial. They, they'll, they'll kill everything from viruses to yeasts, and including bacteria. Um, basically, you're stealing the, the uh, defense mechanism of plants when you 
use essential oils because it's it's basically you've taken the blood of the plants and distilled out the, the stuff that they use to defend themselves against microbes. Um, organic acids mostly they, they mostly just create an environment that the microorganisms, microorganisms can't live in. In other words, most bacteria live in a very narrow pH band. Usually there's a, there's the, the narrowest pH band is where they really thrive, and then a wider pH band where they can actually survive, and then everything outside of that range of pH, they die. So if you shift the pH too dramatically, they die. If you want to sterilize something, just dip it in formic acid, it'll kill everything that's alive on it. So the organic acids are killing off a lot of these microorganisms. The caricides are killing off a lot of the mites and the insects. They're probably not killing the bacteria but because they're pretty much systemic poisons. I, I, I'm using caricides here in the sense of systemic poisons that, that are targeted at the, at, the, at the mites in theory, but actually they're just insecticides that we label as caricides. Um, the funny thing to me is, Having, having started getting into beekeeping in the 60s, I was reading all these beekeeping books, and in the 70s, I actually got into beekeeping. And all the beekeepers I knew from that era were adamant whenever they talked to anybody who was using any kind of pesticides that it was just a trap, that it was nothing but a treadmill, that you use gold, you spray for this insect that you don't want, you kill off all the predators for that insect, so now you have even more of them, and so now you spray even more to try and kill off the ones that no longer have a predator because you kill off the predators and, and so on and so forth. And it was just this vicious cycle and it was a trap. And every, every beekeeper I know had that litany. And as soon as they talked to a farmer, they'd start going through that litany. And as soon as the mites show up, they threw the litany out the door and put the insecticides in their columns. <laughs> and it's a total mystery to me how that happened so quickly. Um, I suppose though, when you lose a, you're losing all your colonies, you get desperate and you fall into what I consider the primary error in logic. The Greeks said the primary error in logic is, is post-hoc ergo propter hoc. Post-hoc ergo propter hoc is that um, after this, because of this, is what that means. It means this happened, and then this happened, so therefore this caused it. Well, you don't know that, but that's, I think that's the tertiary error in logic. I think the primary error in logic is that we need to do something even if it's wrong. And I think it's why Hippocrates came up with his first rule. The first rule of Hippocrates is first, do no harm. Why? Because it's human nature is we want to do something even if it's wrong. And, and so we do. We do something and usually it is wrong. Because unless we're really certain that it's right, it usually is wrong. Because it takes some thought, especially when you're talking about whole ecology and not just one thing. So um, the caricides are basically insecticides that actually were outlawed because they were too dangerous as insecticides. They were too dangerous to humans. They're organophosphates. You know, the cumophos is, the fugalin is not. But the cumophos is an organophosphate. You know, they tell me, I don't know, I'd, I'd like to find an actual source for this, but they tell me there's enough organophosphate in one check mite strip to kill about four adult human beings. Um, so I don't know why you want to put that in a hive anyway, because I want to eat the honey myself. But, um, but you're also going to kill off all, all, all the, those 170 mites that normally live in there, and I don't know how much they, how much effect they have on. The thing about an ecology is everything has a niche, and if something doesn't fill that niche, then something else comes in and fills that niche, or something overpopulates, and, and because there's nothing filling that niche, um, and this is part of the problem with this, defining what's beneficial, what's benign, and what's pathogenic, because I think the lines are pretty blurry. You have a bacteria living on your skin called Staphylococcus aurea, and if you didn't have it living on your skin, you'd have fungus living on your skin, and you would have serious health problems. But is Staphylococcus aurea a beneficial bacteria, or is it a pathogen? Well, if it gets in a cut and it gets infected, it's a pathogen. You, you've got problems. And, and, uh, but if it's, living on your, if it's not living on your skin, you've got problems. So it's beneficial and it's a pathogen. Um, I think you'll find there's a lot of things that work out that way. Uh, chalk root spores, for instance, tend to prevent EHB. I'm kind of baffled to hear that there's a big outbreak of EHB now because uh, chalk, chalk roots showed up back in the 60s and pretty much EHB kind of went away. I hardly ever heard anybody say they had European fowl. I'm sorry, I'm saying EHB. I mean, European fowl root, it was almost unheard of once the chalk root showed up. 
it, it was pretty rare. You had to really stress out a high to end up with any any European foul group. Um, so if we actually, um, I mean, Chuck Fruits act, actually crowd, uh, actually crowds out the EFB. Um, there are bacteria that, that crowd out the EFB and AFB that live in the gut of the bee. Um, it, it actually creates a biofilm. Uh, I think I touched on that a little later here, and I'll tell you the study. You can go look up if you want to read it. Um, the, the, some recent research on the, to follow up on Martha Gillum's research that I mentioned earlier is some guy started looking at the gut, the bacteria that lives in the gut of the bee that she had isolated that seemed to have to do with with them being susceptible to AFB. Um, and they studied it more closely and, and found some mechanism involved, which is that this bacteria creates a biofilm that coats the inside of the gut of the bee. So first of all, it protects them from nosema because it coats the inside of the gut of the bee, which the nosema is trying to attack, and it actually gives them protection from nosema. So when you give them fumadil, it disrupts that bacteria and makes them susceptible to nosema. It might kill the nosema spores, but it makes them susceptible to the disease. Uh, it, it's back to the, I, I might be able to kill these prairie dogs in the lab, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to end up with prairie dogs in real, less prairie dogs in real life. I, you know, I can take Nosema and expose it to Fumadil, and Fumadil will kill it. It's true, but it also kills off all the things that were protecting the bees from the Nosema. Um, stone root toxin actually is what Fumadil is. They take, they take the fungus that causes stone root, they culture it, and they isolate the toxin of that, and they sell it as an antibiotic. It was originally developed for human beings, for fungal infections was their intent, and uh, the problem is it causes birth defects. So the FDA wouldn't approve it. And I know that seems a little odd that you're gonna take something that causes birth defects, put it in syrup, and feed it to the bees. And maybe somebody can explain that to me someday, but uh, that's why it's illegal in all the rest of the world except Canada and UK to use Fumadil. It's illegal. If you use it, they will arrest you uh, because it's against the law. It's a, it's a, it's a known, uh, it's known to cause birth defects. Uh, luckily, it's short-lived, so the, the rationale of making it legal was that the chemical would break down by the time it ever made it to market so that people wouldn't get exposed to it. That was probably true before Nosema serrana showed up and everybody started realizing that Nosema serrana was often a problem in the summer, and people started feeding it all during the year to try and keep the nosema down. And so now I, I'm dreading that someday that's going to make it into the honey supply enough that we have a problem and somebody tracks it back to beekeeping and honey and destroys our industry. But um, let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, now, now, the other issue is not only do some of these protect the gut of the bee from Nosema and creates an environment in their gut that that is not conducive to AFB and EFB, and so it protects them from it because the AFB and the EFB tend to die because of the acidity of their gut, because of those, these bacteria that are living in their gut. But there are other bacteria in yeast we know they can't live without. <clears throat> Most beekeepers are under the impression that bees eat pollen. <clears throat> bees don't eat pollen. Bees can't eat pollen. They can't digest pollen. What they can eat is bee bread. Luckily, they know how to make bee bread out of pollen. So they collect pollen, they bring it to the colony, they inoculate it with bacteria and yeast, and it goes through a two-stage fermentation process that turns it into bee bread, which is digestible and will keep. It keeps, it keeps its protein content and its, its, its nutritional value for a lot longer once it's been turned into bee bread. This is the same concept as making sauerkraut. You take a bunch of cabbages and put them in a pile of rot. But if you take those cabbages and turn them into sauerkraut by fermenting them with some of the same family of bacteria that they ferment the pollen with, which are, which are lactic acid bacteria, then you end up with a fermented product that will actually keep. And that's what the bees do. Now, which bee was smart enough to figure that out one day and teach it to all the rest of us something needs to figure out, right? Um, but they've been doing this for a long time and it works really well. But now you take an antibiotic and put it in there and kill off all the bacteria and you take some, you know, some fumadil, which is another antibiotic, and you kill off all the yeast, um, what do you think is going to happen with bee bread? Um, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, this is the study on the biofilm in the gut of the bee, if you'd like to look it up. If you look up symbionts as major modulators of insect health, 
Um, you can find it online. They have the entire study last I saw on, on um, I, I comes up on Google pretty much at the top of the list if you just put in symbionts as major modulators of insect um, You can go read that study if you're interested. Um, we talked a little about pathogens and beneficial bacteria, but there's the issue of just benign bacteria that we, we have no reason to believe they cause any disease, but we don't know if they do anything particularly helpful. But the fact is those are the kinds of things that fill niches in an ecology that help keep us, that, that help keep the bees healthy. You know, right now they're in the middle of, of really looking at this in human beings and they're starting to conclude that most of our health is determined by the bacteria that lives in our gut and not by our genetics and not by all these other things, but, but by, the, by the positive things that should be living in our gut. Um, that has more to do with whether, whether, we're, whether we get diabetes, whether we, whether we are overweight, whether we have other health issues, that these are actually more to do with the bacteria in our gut. We're going to find that these aren't that different in that respect. My second reason for no treatments uh, until you stop treating, you really can't put selective pressure where it belongs. How many, how many of you were keeping bees back in the 80s when the trachea mites got here? Anybody? Anybody keeping bees back then? It was, it was a big panic. All the bees were going to die. Um, and everybody was treating. And, and then the varroa came along and everybody stopped treating. And as soon as they stopped treating, the problem went away. We don't have any tracheal mite issues that I know of. I don't, I don't know anybody who's treating for tracheal mites, and I don't know anybody. Once in a while, I hear somebody lose a hive, but the symptoms sound like it might be tracheal mites, but it's, it's a rare thing, not a common thing. Um, and that happened because we stopped treating. We put the selective pressure where it needed to be, which is on bees that can survive tracheal mites. And the only way to breed for bees that can survive tracheal mites is to stop treating them. And it's the same for Roa. It's the same for any of the rest of these. As long as, uh, as long as you treat, how do you know whether they can survive these issues? You're you're propping them up. You're trying you're trying to do this for them. Then you don't really know whether they can or not. Uh, you, you can convince yourself you do. You can convince yourself by getting a couple of stages removed from reality. You can say, well, um, I think this trait is what causes them to be resistant to this thing. And then I can test for that trait, and then I can say, well, I've read for that trait, so therefore they'll be resistant to this disease, even though I'm still propping them up, and I've never really exposed them to it. So I really don't know whether it works or not. I don't know whether my assumptions about what the what, what trait would cause them to be able to resist it is correct, and I won't really find out until I quit treating. Um, so you may as well quit treating to start with, and, you'll, find, and you'll, you'll get the ones with the traits that can survive because they have to, if they do or they don't, and some of them do. Um, but if you don't treat, you tend to get these that are resistant to diseases, especially if you keep requeening any of them that, don't, that aren't making it with the ones that are making it, and you get, you get the ones that, that can survive. <coughs> the other downside to treating is you're not only breeding super, you're not only breeding weak bees, but you're breeding better, stronger parasites. Um, if you keep if you keep treating, then basically you're breeding varroa mites that can, re that can reproduce fast enough to keep up with the treatments because they're the ones who are surviving. Um, the ones that can't breed fast enough are getting wiped out. So we've created this artificial, uh, this new artificial ecology that's got all these pressures on it from the outside, from antibiotics, from, from uh, caricides, from whatever, and, and nature has to try and find a new balance within this system you created, and those aren't going to be the ones that can survive outside of that system, those are going to be the ones that can only survive in that system. So my third reason for no treatments is to keep the combs clean of chemicals. Um, I talked about this a little bit in the, in the uh, foundationalist one, um, I'll just mention it here, and that's basically these build up in the wax and if you buy it, if you put chemicals in high, you're going to add more chemicals to your wax, and it's going to build up over time. Um, my fourth reason is a lot of these chemicals are, are very uh, overpowering as far as how, how they affect the bees' ability to smell anything. Um, they interfere with the natural communication in the hive. If you think about it, you know, you, you, everybody's heard the Bonfrich stuff, I assume. 
know, the bees do their little dance and they tell the other bees how far away and what direction the nectar source is. That's all well and good, but the, the thing they do probably that helps every bit as much as the direction and the distance is that they share the smell of that nectar with their nest mates who then go out that direction looking for that smell. Um, and that's how they communicate. This is what I'm collecting, and then that's how far it is and, 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 and what direction it is. But there's a lot of other communication going on in the hive that's also by smell besides just foraging. There's Basically, it's how they know that there's brood that needs to be fed. It's how they know that they need to go gather more pollen because there's brood that needs to be fed. It's how they know that there's a queen laying or there's not a queen laying or there's a queen failing. And we need to replace her because we can't smell enough QMP and so we need to replace the queen. You wonder why a lot of, I hear an awful lot of people who are using a variety of things like, like uh, thymol and, and formic acid who suddenly their queens are getting superseded right and left. Well, you don't think part of that is because they can't smell that there's a queen there? Um, and, and then you've got essential oils. Some of the essential oils actually mimic some of the pheromones that the bees make. Lemongrass is a dead ringer for Nazanoff pheromone. Um, Nazanoff pheromone is, uh, it's hard to put a, a simple definition on that, Nazanoff pheromone, but Nazanoff is pretty much a, uh, we're here and we need to get organized to smell. <coughs> If you, if you open up a hive, you always see a few bees that will come up to the top and stick their butt in the air and start fanning, and that's what they're doing. They're doing Nazanoff. They know something's been disrupted, and they figure everybody needs to know where the colony is, and this is where we are, so we're going to let everybody know where we are. Um, and Swarm does a lot. They put off a whole bunch of Nazanoff so that all the bees who are out scouting for new locations and all the bees that hadn't made it here yet from the hive or whatever, they put out that smell so they can, they can tell where the swarm is. And it's also how the, how the uh, scout bees go mark the place that they're voting for when they're trying to, when they're trying to find a place. They go to the place, they mark it with some Nazanoff. They fly back to the colony and say, well, it's over that way, and it's this far, just the same kind of dance as they do for the nectar, and then, then those bees fly out looking for that Nazanoff smell. So you take lemongrass oil, which is in Honeybee Healthy and some other products, and it's, it's a dead ringer for, for Nazanoff. It works great for swarm water. It's a great swarm water. Um, so we put that in the hive, how does that mess with their communication? Uh, that, that's hard to, say, hard to say, we're bound to cover things up. I've seen thymol and, and, and formic acid just driving right out of the hive. So I know, I know it's disrupting a lot of things, including their um, communication. Um, the argument everybody always gives me is, well, if I don't treat all my hives, they're going to die. Well, I don't know, all my hives didn't die. Um, we had this panel just last, was that just last week? Yeah, I think it was just last week, you know, at the Ohio State meeting, and we're all up on the podium, and, and somebody up there said that, you know, some, well, somebody said we should just stop treating them, and, and I was down on the panel and said we should just stop treating them, and then we'd, get, we'd already be past this if we'd have stopped. If we'd never treated them, we'd already be past this. And I've heard every one of them scientists that I know that have ever sat down at a table and say that at one time or another. If we had never treated the row, we'd already be past this. Um, but he, he, he said that, and, and somebody on the panel piped in and said, but they might all die. And Dan said, but mine didn't. I haven't been treating them for five or six years, and they didn't all die. So that's obviously not true. And uh, I haven't treated any of mine in more than a decade for anything. If you put all the years together, I only ever treated them for anything on about three years out of 40. Um, and, and I wished I hadn't. All of those were mistakes that I wished I'd never done. But um, the first year was when I first started, and I, everybody convinced me I'd get AFP and all my bees, they'd come and burn all my equipment if I didn't give them teramycin. So the first year I did, because the, all the books said that, and then I started, getting, I started getting the magazines and looking at the magazines, and there were people who never thought it was a bad idea. I, I thought it was a bad idea too, but I didn't know enough about bees to, to be confident in that idea, you know? So I never used Terramycin again after that. And, and um, so the theory is, more than we're going to die. Well, the last bee informed survey um, of all the people who were treating, um, the average was that they lost 30% of their hives. And the average of the people who weren't treating was that they lost 30% of their hives. So I don't know if that's a fair argument. I don't think you will lose any more. Will you lose any less? At first, 
it probably won't make any difference. But I think in the long run, it does make a difference. Because in the long run, you're selecting for bees that can survive. And in the long run, the people are treating are not selecting for bees that can survive. But part of, part of what's in this whole dynamic is that people keep bringing in bees that can't survive to replace all the ones they lost, which keep mating with your queens, which keeps watering down the genetics, which makes this makes it harder for us to get to that point where they can all survive. But all in all, right now, the statistics would be that you break even by not treating right now, but in the long run, I think we'll come out way ahead. Um, but that's assuming, I, I don't know how many people I've met in the last 10 years who going around speaking at beekeeping meetings, but I, I can't even count how many people I've had say, well, I was treating them and they all died, and that's when I just decided I wasn't going to do it anymore. And I quit treating, and, and some of them still died, but they're doing pretty good all in all. Um, the last time I treated, they all died, and that's when I quit treating. <laughs> but um, I, I was using fluvalinate, and it didn't work at all. But um, worst case is, maybe, maybe the same amount die, and then uh, the ones that survive them have better genes. And you can make up those losses, you can raise more beans. I recommend that philosophy. You really ought to go into winter with more bees than you want to have in spring, and then maybe you'll come out about right. If you accidentally end up with too many bees, there's always somebody out there who wants to buy some. It's, there's no shortage of a market for bees. I can sell all of them I can raise. I'm tempted to quit my job and just raise bees. I think I, I don't know that I can. The problem is nobody wants to pay. You can sell them, but nobody wants to pay enough to actually make a really. I make a lot of money as a computer programmer. It's kind of hard to walk away from it. But, um, so if you don't treat, what are the advantages? Well, of course you don't have to buy the treatments. That's a big plus right there. You uh, don't have to drive out to the yards and put the treatments in the colonies. You don't have to drive out to the yards and pull them out, which a lot of you aren't doing, and you really should. If you're going to use treatments, you need to go out and pull them out because you're just contributing to resistant disease, <laughs> plus you're putting way more contamination in your and your beeswax, but the problem is I think there's these people who think that I paid this good money for this yeah. strip, I want to stay in there and keep killing the varroa, but the fact is it's not killing the varroa anymore, it's just helping them build resistance because it's still there, but it's at a sublethal level, and it's hurting the bees, so you really need to get it out of there. Um, but you don't contaminate your wax, you don't upset that ecosystem of the hive, you can breed for bees that can survive, and you can breed for mites that can live in a balance with the bees. Okay, so my first point was no treatments. My second point of the four points here is breeding local survivors. Um, if, if you find bees that are surviving, and I know everybody always makes the argument, how do I know whether they're just recent escape bees or they're actual feral bees? Well, the easy way is to look at the size of them because an actual comb is much smaller than a large cell comb, and it actually takes them a couple of turnovers of comb to get back down to natural size. So recent escape bees tend to be big bees. The ones that have been out there for at least, a, the ones that are a swarm of a swarm of a swarm of a swarm tend to be small bees because they built their own comb and then they swarm and built their own comb and swarm and built their own comb and they're back down to normal size. A normal size, actual normal size bees are, are two thirds of the size of the bees you're keeping on large cell comb. So they're noticeably smaller. You don't, have, you don't even have to measure, you can look at them and see that they're smaller. Um, so recent swarms, don't tend to be. They tend to be about the same size as the bees you've got on a large cell phone. Um, so you, you can actually tell the survivors from the recent escape bees usually. Um, but also, all in all, if you keep collecting the wild ones, some of them are at least going to be from feral survivors. Uh, but I try to I try to not breed from anything that I haven't had in my hives that have that I know has survived at least a winter where I live. Because an awful lot of getting bees that survive, for me, is, the, is my climate, it's the weather, it's the winter that's my problem. Uh, Varroa haven't been a problem, but winter is still a problem. If I get bees from the south, they don't tend, and from California, they just don't tend to get through the winters very well. But the local feral survivors, they've been surviving, and they do really well in my winters. Um, so I definitely know they're survivors. Once I've had them in my eye for a winter, I know they survived the winter. I know I'm not treating them, so I have some idea what I've got. But I like to start with feral bees. Um, I also like to consider that my drone supply. That's the one. That's the drones I really want them to breed with. Is the ones that are out there surviving. Unfortunately, we have people constantly bringing in more bees, watering down those genetics. But um, 
The other thing about raising your own local survivors and raising queens is you can do it at the, ma at the optimum time for nutrition. You can do it when there's, there's a maximum amount of food and pollen. And the queen breeders are trying to raise them as early as possible because beekeepers keep demanding them as early as possible, and so they raise them when it's not optimal times to raise queens, and they don't get well bred, and they don't get well fed, and they're not very good queens. The quality of queens has been in a steady decline in my estimation for the last 20 years. Um, 20 years ago, the quality of queens was way better than it is now. I mean, the quality of packages was way better than it is now. I could actually get a package from Georgia and it would probably survive in Nebraska. Uh, but I, that doesn't seem to be true anymore. Uh, and I think it's partly, it, it's partly just that they're so inbred, I think, but it's also partly because they're living in a different climate. The other thing that you can do that, that the queen breeders really don't have the time or money to do unless you pay twice as much for your queens is that you can leave them in mating nuke or and or if you're not using mating nuke, you could actually put the queen cell in a queenless hive and let it emerge and, and just lay from that point on. Her ovarians start to develop when she first starts to lay eggs and they continue to develop over the next two to three weeks. And if you interrupt that development by catching her or putting her in a cage where she can't lay, then that, that development stops and so they don't get fully developed. And if they don't fully develop, not only do they not last as long as a queen, uh, as far as when they run out of eggs or they run out of, uh, of the ability to be a good, uh, a good prolific layer, but they don't make enough pheromones to keep the bees happy if they're not as, as well developed in their ovarials, and so they get superseded quicker. Um, so you can leave them in there and let them develop more and have a better quality queen because you've got the time to take to do it. You know, it's, it's not, it's really not, I think it's kind of obvious that you can take the time to raise a better queen. But what they've told you for the last 30 years in the bee magazines is that the professionals should be doing this because you, you can possibly know what you're doing. Well, actually, the bees are the ones who know what they're doing. If you do it at the time that they're of a mind to do a good job of it, you can probably get some pretty good queens. Um, the other thing is, I, I know there's people who want to requeen every year, and you can do that if you like, but you're basically selecting <coughs> against bees that are smart enough, not exactly selecting against it, but you're not selecting for bees that are smart enough to sense that the queen is failing and replace her. In nature, there's a very strong selective pressure for this. If a colony doesn't sense that the queen's failing and she fails, then the colony dies. That's it. If, if the colony does sense that the queen's failing and they replace her, then the genetic line continues because they were smart enough to know that the queen was failing and replace her. If we keep replacing the queens for them, there's no selective pressure for that. So now you're getting bees that aren't smart enough to know that the queen's failing to replace them. Um, I, I hadn't actually thought about this. I wasn't requeening, but Mike Palmer pointed this out, that that's the problem with requeening all the time, is that you end up with bees that aren't smart enough to, to, to sense that. And you really need to, you want bees that are smart enough to do that, because then you don't have to go out there every year and find every queen and replace them all. Um, they'll take care of it for you. As once in a while, I see one that doesn't, and I, I pull a queen out of a colony that is smart enough to put her in that one, and they'll raise a queen. Yeah. Um, obviously, you save some money by not buying queens, but the other thing I think you'll find is it, it, it's awfully handy to have a queen when you need one. Right now, not I have to track somebody down who might have a queen, and then I have to order it, and then it has to get here, and then I have to... Then I have to put this caged queen who's been banked for I don't know how long and banked I don't know how soon in a, in a colony and try and introduce her and get them to accept her. It's much easier to get them to accept a queen who was laying five minutes ago than it is to get them to accept a queen who was laying two months ago. Because the queen who was laying five minutes ago makes way more pheromones and she's much better accepted. I can, I can pretty much take a frame of bees with a laying queen on it and stick it in almost any queenless colony and they, they'll just accept her. I, I don't even have to introduce her because um, they, she already has an entourage. You know, I, I'm a little smoke in there, just you know, get a little confusion for when I first put it in there. But um, Brother Adam was convinced they can't tell one lane queen from another lane queen. They can just tell the quality of the queen. I don't entirely agree with them because I've seen too many times where I was working with stacked up mating nukes that are for they're, they're, they're four across, and when they're stacked up like this, and I'm working my way down, and the bees that were coming back to this one, flying to this one, and start balling this queen instantly. 
So I think they do know that it's not the queen, but um, but I think if, if she's a lame queen, and she was lame a little while ago, and they know they're queenless, they're pretty much just glad to see a queen around. But on the other hand, you put a caged queen in there, and they just, she does not come across as a really good quality queen, because she hasn't been lame lately, and she doesn't make the right pheromones. So you have some, a whole bunch of advantages here. I already have a queen on hand. She's probably going to be really well accepted. And it changes your whole philosophy when you've got queens on hand um, of, of what I'm going to do. Because if I have to buy a queen and I've got to pay 25 bucks, and it's going to take me two weeks of, of phone calls and whatever to finally get one here. Sometimes you can't get one at all because nobody has one. Um, it just changes your whole philosophy of life to have a bunch of some nukes out there. Also, if you're raising your own queens, you usually have queen cells. You can do all sorts of things with queen cells you can't really do with a queen. I can stick a queen, I got a hot hive here that's just too hot to try and find a queen. I can stick a queen cell in there, and there's a good chance I can cause a supersedure and never have to find that queen. Um, because the, the queen's going to emerge from the queen cell. She's just going to get accepted as a new version of super, that's superseding the old queen. She'll allow me come back and she'll look really the old queen. Um, about an 80% chance of that working out really well. And, and if you've ever dealt with a really vicious hive and tried to find a queen in it, um, that 80% chance is probably worth it worth doing is if it's not in your backyard or your neighbors are getting stung and you've got to do something quicker. Um, that's a different issue. But I, I think the most important reason to do all this as far as raising your own queens is, is the overall genetic diversity of bees in North America is, is not good. We need more pockets of genes and we need to maintain them. And as long as we keep having just a few queen breeders raising thousands and thousands of sister queens and shipping them all over the country, we're just bottlenecking that genetic pool. If you raise your own queens, you're going to help maintain the genetic diversity of honeybees. Um, this is a quote from Randy Oliver. Uh, but if you're not part of the genetic solution of breeding my tolerant bees, then you're part of the problem. Um, I, that comes down to the fact that if you keep bringing in genetics of bees that have to be propped up with chemicals, and you just keep watering down the genetics in the area where you are with bees that can't survive on their own. You're not really in an Africanized honeybee area, uh, at least not yet. Um, I hope you're not. Um, but I really think the issue here is temperament. Uh, there's other issues I don't like about Africanized bees besides temperament. They, they abscond too easily, they swarm too easily. You definitely don't want them if you can avoid them. But if you live in an Africanized honeybee area and you raise your own queens, then this becomes an issue. What, what do I do about their genetics? Well, I'd still look at them from a point of view of, of if they're productive and they're gentle and they're and they're healthy, then I really don't care what their ancestry is. And if they're not productive, or they're not healthy, or they're not gentle, then I don't want to keep them, regardless of what their ancestry is. Um, I'm always amazed on bee source or, or any of these bee forms. Somebody will come on and say their bees are really hot, and instantly everybody jumps in and says, well, you've got to have a test and find out if they're Africanized. Why are you going to keep them if they're not? I don't, I don't understand that philosophy. If, if they're mean, I'm going to requeen them. I'm not going to keep them. Um, I don't. I don't know why you would, but I don't know a lot of people in Africanized areas raising their own queens and collecting feral swarms, and they occasionally get one that's too hot, and they requeen them, um, and you'll know, have to deal with that if they move this far north. Um, it would also help, though, if you don't want Africanized queen bees in this area, that's another good reason for you to raise your own queens in this area, so that you stop bringing them in from places where they might be Africanized. Texas is almost all Africanized. Um, I, I admire that the that the weavers are not treating their bees anymore. That's great. But um, I don't want to risk bringing Africanized bees in. So, and they're right in the middle of Africanized bee territory. I'm not picking on them, but I'm just saying, buying bees from Africanized bee areas and bringing them in here is not, is not a solution if there's anything that I can think of. Um, I think you ought to avoid that. Natural food's my third point here. Um, there's plenty of studies out there that follows about <laughs> well, let me say briefly that uh, uh, the pH of honey and the pH of sugar are different, and that obviously affects that bacteria we talked about in the gut, and there's some um, research from Martha Gillum that, that feeding them sugar syrup will affect that bacteria in their gut, and I'll skip through all of that. You can look this up on my website. Um, I try to leave them honey, I think, uh, to get through the winter rather than feeding them. And natural colony already covers the foundations, so there's my four steps. 
Thanks.